bad she was trying to, I cannot hear anything. So, so now I have a new appreciation and understanding for all of you that can't be here in person that log on. I just want to say thank you because sometimes it's a little hard. And what I found with Laura, because she stood up because there was a big crowd. So she, you know, sometimes like you have more energy when you're standing, but as soon as she sat down in front of the Zoom, it was much easier to hear her. So I'm going to be sitting here for today. Sometimes I like to stand, it depends on my mood, but I'm going to just stay over here and um, everyone is very spread out. So I hope we're all going to be able to hear. Okay. So just project. Yes. So I just want to give a shout out to, we actually have two new people that have never been here on a Tuesday morning class. So Rifki and Allison came all the way from West Rogers Park. And it's so nice to have Rifki back. She's been re recovering from a situation. I don't know if you want to go into it, but thank God she's on the men's. And it's really, really, really nice. I, I feel like saying a blessing. Like, I don't know what blessing to say, but... Baruch Hashem, <laughs> like literally giving you another, like a new lease on life. She was in so much pain and she had to have a corrective surgery and, and literally like, I don't know if it was on your way home from the surgery, but you, the first text that we all got, cause we're all waiting to hear. And she's like, I'm out of pain. And it's almost like, you know, saying like, like almost like there's the blessing that we say, like, hamitim, like, like, thank you God for like bringing life to the dead. Like, I almost feel in a way like Rifki was just like, I can't, I can't do this anymore. And then all of a sudden we have the new Rifki, new and improved. So Baruch Hashem. Okay, so you guys didn't hear all that, but all the the medical gory details okay <laughs> so um for all of our newcomers we we give out notebooks but i only have one more notebook we have to get some more made oh yeah okay fine so do you guys i don't know if Riffy, do you have one okay so but maybe you could share it with and if you need we have Now we're going to get started. Is this yours? Oh. Oh, okay. Oh, okay. Okay, great. Great, great, great. Oh, okay. I don't know what it is, but I'll look at it afterwards. Okay, great. So um, just a few housekeeping before we get started, a few details. So first of all, I, I thank you for all coming out in such cold weather today. It just feels like it's uh, you live, you're used to this. Six I don't know, degrees, I don't know how people do this, but Baruch Hashem, and um, and this, as I think all of you know, I'm I'm heading onto um, stepping onto a plane on Thursday morning to go to Morocco, and I'm going to be gone for two solid weeks. Oh. So, um, yeah, I know oh, I'm true. making that all of you have every class will be there'll be a sub so you could the schedule is as regular it's just going to continue uh the next two tuesdays gaddy's going to take over my class he's doing a really fascinating uh class on the zodiacs he, I, Oh, there's no sound. We can't hear you. Thank you, Gloria. Better? Yes. So he's going to be teaching on the zodiacs, which is such an interesting topic, especially for women, in my opinion, because the woman and the moon, right, the, the way that all of the Rosh Chodesh fall um, are very significant. We're, it's very tied into our cycle, our moods, our everything. So really attaching yourself to the months and the significances of the month really help you understand what you're going through. So I think it's fascinating. It's going to be next Tuesday and you'll see, like he'll see if it, it might turn into a two weeks on the same topic if need be, or else he'll change the topic for the second Tuesday. Really, really fascinating. Yeah. I can't remember her name. 
Yeah. Yeah, Rabbi Kellerman. And... Yeah, no, I think it was a woman. I was so she, Yeah. Okay. Yeah, okay. yeah it's, it's really pretty incredible. But what book is it? I can't remember. Okay. But, um, and maybe it's Sipora Heller. I think she has. Yeah, Sipora Heller has a book on it. Uh, yeah. Mm -hmm. That's right. Um, Here it was with me. Yeah, so men would also, okay, but so that's next Tuesday. I really, I don't want to hear like, oh, no one showed, like, just keep coming. It's it's amazing. <laughs> Guys, please help me. It's my marriage. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do a girl a favor, okay? <laughs> okay, so that's Tuesdays. And then Saturdays, which is whoever comes on Saturday knows it's it's like a love fest. As as Regina says, she says, I'm a partial holic. So, um, so we're not stopping our partial classes for the partial holics. Um, the first week, Malka, Malka Bright is going to be my sub. She's a, a beloved teacher here at L'Chaim. She's so excited. She's been preparing this class for three weeks. I mean, I feel, I feel like after I give my classes over to people, like, you know, when Susie Futterman was, was um, doing it for me when I was in Israel, like, I almost feel like, do you guys even want me back? after having these incredible teachers so so we have malka the first week and then the second week we're having heather razi who just came back from the last trip to israel and she's someone that studies the parsha every week and she's so excited to throw herself into this to this project so that's going to be saturdays yeah yeah but she said that if she can't make it she's going to leave like kind of like worksheets it's going to be study with a buddy i have a feeling she'll be here but I'll be in touch with you guys on our WhatsApp chats and, you know, we'll, we'll be in touch from there. Okay, so let's start. Um, we are coming to the end of this incredible book. I think it's been pretty fascinating. There were two, two sets of women, well, two, two topics that needed to be finished that I thought I'm going to squeeze it all in and we're going to finish it before my trip so that when I come back, we'll start with something fresh. But I, I couldn't squeeze it all into this week. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to start with a little bit of the conclusion to this topic. We're going to do one woman in particular, but really it's it's talking about two women. Okay, so it's one in particular, Hannah, and her rival, Penina. We're going to focus on those two women today. And then when I get back, we're going into the month of Adar. So I'm going to do a special one or two classes on the matriarch, not the matriarch, but the heroine of Esther, and also the energy of Purim and what it means specifically for a woman. Okay, so that that might be a one to two part when I come back in two weeks. Okay, so and then we finish this entire book, which is so incredible. So to get started, we're going to start with the conclusion. And um, there is a very famous, and Julie, you're recording, right? Yeah. Okay, great. Yeah, it looks good. Okay. There's a very famous story um, written in the Gemara. This is a story that was brought down thousands of years ago about this individual. His name was Choni Hamagal. Does anyone recall that name? Allison, you, do, do you recall it? Okay, the circle maker, Choni the circle maker. Do you know the story, Ricky? No, vaguely, like it's a name that you're like, oh, remember that name he from, yeah, he made circles, like wherever he was, there he was, he made the circle around him. But what was so interesting about this individual is that he was found planting a tree. I think it was a carob tree. I don't know if it was a fruit tree. This story is familiar to a lot of you. And someone stopped him and said, how long will it take for that tree to bear fruit? And he said, I don't know, maybe 70 years. So he said, so why are you planting it? Right, you've heard the story. It's a very famous story. It's it's a it's a commonly shared story because the meaning is so powerful for our lives. Because what is our life all about, right? What was his answer, Sue? Why is he planting this tree that he will never be able to reap the fruit from for the future? His children, maybe his grandchildren, even right? It's not for him. He'll never partake in it. But he is a person that's not only living in the here and now, his life goes beyond him. He's living for his legacy. He's living for the, the heritage that he's gonna leave to, the, to those that will pick it up after him, okay? So, so taking that example and bringing it back to, to the topic of women, because we've been going through all these fabulous women. 
right? A woman that is planting a seed that she might not ever see the fruit of that seed. She might not reap the benefits, but she's still planting a seed, whatever that seed might be. It might be a seed in the direction of her family. It might be in the direction of her community. It might be in the direction of helping people get on their feet. It might be chesed. It might be, you know, feeding people. And feeding is not only physical. It's feeding people emotionally, spiritually, right? And physically. There's We have people here that volunteer at soup kitchens with, uh, with what do you call it? Ma'ot pitim and Tomchei Shabbos. And you could speak to Dana if you want to get involved in some of these things. But there are many ways of feeding people that... It, you might not ever, ever see the benefits of your action. Um, is anyone here a parent that was here on Sunday? Sunday night, we had the bat mitzvah moms. So I don't think any of you were there. We had a guest speaker. I was there. Tom, who's this fabulous. Oh, you were there. Sophia was there. I think his name was, was it Dr. Barr? He was um, a retired doctor who is now devoting his life to fixing bikes and helping people in, 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 you know, you know, third world countries. They send ship, shiploads of bikes so that people could, A, get to work and make their own living. Or, and I don't think he was a dentist, but he's just, yeah, sorry. I, I wish I remembered his name, but doesn't matter. He was, he's helping people get to where they need to get to, helping kids get to their school so they could possibly have an education and have a, have a chance. Now, he'll never meet these people. All he's doing is fixing a bike. He is such a skilled genius of a man who fixed hearts and bodies and surgeries and for his whole life. He's probably in his 70s and he just recently retired. And now what he's doing is he's fixing these bikes, he's sending them off, and he's the one that actually spoke about are our actions altruistic? He asked the girls that question. We had to explain what that word meant. How do you explain altruism to a 12 year old girl, right? When you do a good act, like, are you doing it for pure motives? Is it a hundred percent pure or are you getting something back? But what do you think the answers were? Just curious. Okay, so, so maybe, so what are you getting back? Okay, so, so the feel good. So it feels good, but is that really getting something back? There are many, many levels to getting back. Like if I give this donation, I wanna see my name on the building, right? That's another level. And that's also a very high level because it helps other people be encouraged to also give. There, it's a level, but there are many, many levels. And if you're doing something for very pure motives and all you're doing is all you're getting back is feeling good, that's a very high motive. That's pretty altruistic. So the women that we have been speaking about for the last couple months, they've all made, you know, huge contributions to the Jewish world, to their worlds and beyond. Last week, I think it was last week, we were talking about how many generations are even going to remember your name. Right. It's a pretty it's a pretty heavy thought. Like, do you know your great great grandmother's name? Most of us do not. We took a we took a poll last week. Most people said no. We know our grandmother's names. Many of us know our great grandparents names. Do we know our great great grandparents names? And the answer was no. That means that three generations after we're gone, no one's even going to know we existed. So how do we how do we get to a level all these women that we have been speaking about have been discussed and learned about and studied and try and try to you know people try to emulate their ways for thousands of years how is it possible that in thousands of years after we are gone we're still our essence there's going to be something in the world a seed that sprouts that people are still benefiting from the fruits. And so it's a big question for us to really ponder and how to really leave a legacy behind for generations to come. Oh, okay. One of the examples she gives was a very tragic example that really 
kind of speaks volumes nowadays with so much that's happening in the world as far as terrorism all over the world. But the example that she gives is in 2015, we all probably recall, we probably remember the terrible um, terrorist attack. It was a shooting at in a French kosher supermarket and, and the terrorists came in, they took some people hostage. So there were a few people that survived, a few people that didn't. I don't remember all the details from it, but I just remember it was a, a traumatic experience for the entire world. And um, one of the, the cashiers who was, she was held hostage, she was actually interviewed. And she speaks that during, during this terrible traumatic experience, the only thing she thought of was to pray. And she didn't, she doesn't know prayers, all the prayers off my heart, like, what would you pray? So something came to mind and she started you know, reciting a, a Psalm of Tehillim by, by heart. And it was the Tehillim chapter that has the words, I look to the mountains, from where does my help come? My help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. So the question is, and, and it, was, it was pretty crazy because all the people that survived, you know, articles came out, people wrote, wrote many, many, many words were, were much ink was spilt on this, on this uh, episode. And the question is, where did this woman or all of those people get the strength to react in the way that they reacted, right? You would think you go into panic mode when you're panicked and who could think of a, a Psalm of Tehillim? Who could think of God in that moment? Who could think, right? But, but all of them said that like, their only thing that they only felt like only God could help me. They were so in the zone in that moment. And where did they get that strength from? So, this is just one example, but really any hard thing that happens and when someone rises and has the strength and you say, where did you get that strength from? So what we know is that these people in that moment are standing on the shoulders of giants. They're standing on the shoulders of great people that came before them. We know from all the stories we've been learning that when, when push comes to shove, when someone is in so much pain, they turn to God. Right, We know that from all the matriarchs, all the stories we've been sharing, so much pain and anguish in their own life. There's, there's a need, there's a lacking. They cry out to God. And we even learned that sometimes God holds back giving something to someone because they're great and he wants them to pray. Their prayers have to come into the world for some reason, right? It might not go to them, but it, you know, um, many of you know that last, was last Monday that my dear friend Sharon Shanker passed away. And I, I listened to the funeral, not once, but twice. That's how inspiring it was. I, I shared the link. If anyone wants to be inspired, have you ever been inspired by a funeral? Like totally inspired off your feet? It was so inspiring because a funeral really shows you, well, what is my life about? And what do I want people to say about me after 120? So if anyone wants the link, seriously, it was incredible. So one of the things, um, one of the things, what was I going to share about the funeral? Um, oh, one of the rabbis shared that all the women, because she she had 500 women that she took on trips to Israel. She was she was my colleague in Momentum for over a decade, and she took they took bus loads, like a bus load at a time, from her community in LA. So 500 women that were like praying for her, saying psalms every day. They had, we were on a chat of Psalms and every few hours you would look and there were like 300 messages because everyone is praying, praying, praying and just, just like sharing where they're up to on the prayer book so that people could continuously like through the night in different countries, just keep praying. So obviously the question is, well, where did all those prayers go to? I mean, some of these women are not like full believers. They're not sure. They asked the rabbi where, where I was praying, where's, where did my prayers go to? So the rabbi said during the funeral, and it was, um, I heard the sobs, like once he said this, because it, because I think that's a question that a lot of us struggle with when we pray, pray, pray for something and it doesn't come out the way that we wanted. So, so the rabbi said, all of you have been asking me that question, where are my prayers? And clearly he was, he pointed to her five children sitting in the front row. I'm telling you. And he said, all of your prayers 
wed into these children. And they know that you all prayed and they are so much stronger because of it. And it was, it was yeah. such a moment, like you hear like the sobs in the room, but we don't understand where all of our energies go, but we still put them out there. Not necessarily for us. It wasn't for Sharon. It wasn't meant to be. It was for her future generations. Okay. And please God, they should stay strong. They should have the, the koach, the strength always. So all of these women planted seeds for us to reap, for us to learn from, and for us to also make a plan for ourselves. What are we going to leave to this world? What legacy, what, what legacy are we leaving behind? So, so in the last, the final um, chapter, before we get into our woman of the day, I just want to share a little bit about the chaotic world that we live in. Okay. And I was listening to a podcast this morning. I, I, you know, we all have our routines. So when I get dressed in the morning, I always put on a specific podcast. It's a Jewish podcast. Um, it comes from Lakewood, New Jersey. It's called Coach Menachem. I don't know if any, like I, half of it is in Hebrew. It's like, Yinglish. It's like Yiddish English, you know, it's like, I don't know if you would understand. Yeah, it's very yeshivish. Yeah. But, but it's like, for me, it's like, it's kind of like a window into like another world. So I kind of, even though I don't understand everything that goes on, but I, so this morning there was a woman that got on and asked, she was so heartbroken. I don't know what her story was, but she said, it feels like we're right before Mashiach. And her voice, she was crying while she couldn't, she could barely get the words out. The, the amount of tragedies in the world, the amount of heartache and pain that we all have in our lives, every single home has tragedy. Every single family is suffering with something. This is, she was speaking, it was very raw. So she asked the rabbi, she said, it feels like Mashiach is, should be coming right now. But but I'm scared that it might be another 200 and something years because we know that we, we have this timeline throughout history from the beginning of the Jewish people, which is the beginning. And then we have 2000 years, 2000 years, 2000 years. And what year are we in right now? Five, seven, eight, six, five, seven, eight, three, five, seven, eight, three, which leaves us with how many years till 6,000? just over 200 years. So her question was so spot on. She said, I know that we're, she, she almost, and she sounded almost like a girl. Like she sounded almost like maybe a, a, like a young adult, but she wasn't an older woman. She was a young person that was clearly dealing with a lot of, of pain. And she said, it feels so close, but I'm so scared that it might even be in 200 years, right? Like I might even not even live to see it. By the way, when I heard her ask that question, I mean, I'm sure she broke everyone's heart open because we could all understand that pain that we see, that we feel day to day. And like, you know, we kind of feel helpless. So interesting. I don't know, the rabbi didn't make this connection, but I was thinking the greatest man of the previous generation in the Jewish world was the Chafetz Chaim, right? Are you familiar with that name, the Chafetz Chaim? He was the founder of the, the movement on Shmirat Halashan, which is guarding your tongue. He wrote books and books on, on all the laws of gossip and not slandering. And I mean, look him up. There's, there's so much beautiful wisdom that he brought to the Jewish world and wrote down. So, and he passed away before World War II. So in the early 1900s, I think he passed away. And he had a very famous quote that he once said that, he was quoted many times and he, he basically said i'm so excited to greet the mashiach by the way this man lived his life with his bag packed at the door his shabbos clothes because he probably had one pair of shabbos clothes and one regular pair of clothes his shabbos clothes were hanging by the door with a bag he was ready he lived his life ready to greet the mashiach at any moment he was waiting for that donkey for that shofar blast whatever it would look like and sound like he was waiting his whole essence was waiting 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 like this like this young woman but his quote was i'm so excited to greet the mashiach like it's coming i hear its footsteps and then he said but i'm so scared to live in that generation it was so profound and he was someone of so much faith and such a, a tzaddik of a person. But anyways, I heard it in this woman's voice. Like, she might not be there. We might not be there. But our great-grandchildren may, may be there. So we have to make sure that they know who we are and they know what we stood for. 
so that's the, so that they're still getting on that bus or getting on that boat to go towards you know that redemption, that better time. We have to make sure that someone's going to want to pick up that piece. Um, this might be a painful story to share, but it's a true story. I hope it's okay if I share it. It's a story of a friend of mine in Portland who um, was making a bar mitzvah for her son. She had one child, one son, and the bar mitzvah was coming. She did have siblings. She did have nieces and nephews. And um, she wanted it to be special. This is her one child. So she, she asked her mom, who was already living in an old age home at the time, she asked if she could use her father's talus. Like she found it in a box in the attic and it was all dusty. No one had used it. And the mother said, you know, like and the mother was already in the old age home and maybe maybe not a hundred percent in touch with the whole situation of the family but the mother said you know what i don't want you to use it because i'm scared that your siblings and your cousins and everyone's going to be jealous they're going to be if i give it to your son i mean th then they're not going to have the opportunity like i don't want to create conflict in the family and my friend told me it was quite a moment she said she did the math the, me the mental calculations of like her siblings and their kids and where everyone's going and the directions. And she said, and I realized no one, no one would even remotely want to have that talus. Like there was no one that was going to be asking for it. And the message is that we need to make sure that whoever it is down the line from us, they're going to want that talus. They're going to want that connection. So that's what all of these women have done. The thousands of years we're still learning from them. Let's jump in. Let's learn about our woman of the day, um, Hannah. Hannah and and her, I don't know if we could call it her rival. I don't know if that's, but Hannah and Penina, they kind of go together. And um, we're going to have to be open-minded when we learn about the dynamic between the two women, because um, at face value, it might seem it might seem like you know certain things were not necessary and when we go a little deeper into the midrash into like the the stories around the stories we we understand that sometimes good intentions could come across in a way that is too harsh and there might be punishment so even good intentions can go punished because we have as we learned last tuesday night with laura martyr we have bechira which is free will so even if we're meant to carry out a certain edict from above, we still have choice in how we carry it out. It could be done with sensitivity or it could be done in a way that's cruel. So Penina messed up in how she carried out her action. She was from, a, from the good side. She was, some people say she was a righteous woman. Some people say that she didn't do anything wrong. She wanted to evoke and draw out the, the prayer of Hana. But from the other side of the story, it was so painful for Hana that it was almost like she was considered a cruel person. Okay, so let's go to the beginning of the story and understand some background. Okay, so we learn Hana's story from the book of Samuel, okay, which that, that is her son. So the story is written down in that book. Samuel Shmuel was considered one of the prophets. And I think last week we went through who all the prophets and all the prophetesses were. So this is one of them. And this is the end of the time of judges. It's the era of the kings. It's a, a beautiful time in Israel. And the word Hannah, which we have Hannah sitting right here, and Hannah got her name at this place that we're going to be talking about right here at the story. So, yeah, and many people were here. So feel free to share any of your thoughts, Hannah. So the word Hannah, okay, so it's three letters, Chet, Nun, He. By the way, there are so many meanings that I can share with you about, about that word. Um, the, the, the one that some of you... Yiddish speakers, Lori, I see you're here, right? And and Mimi, you probably speak a little Yiddish also. Abisala? Abisala. Okay. So what's the word chain? No, 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 no. Not yeah. That's great. <laughs> but but chain, do you know? I mean it's a Yiddish word, right? Yeah? Like 
and it's so funny because when you say what what does the Yiddish word mean, most of us can't even translate it because it's its own word, right? Oh, thank you. Oh, thank you, thank you. That's what my that's what my babies always told me. I, I told you guys this. I have one sister. They said, "Oh, Shuli, my sister, she's the beautiful one, and Eve has chen." That's what they always told me. I'm like, thanks, guys, thanks. But it's okay. Chen could take you very far in life. Okay, so Chen is like it's um it's a spark. There's something special, right? So Chana, Chana, and the word Chen are they're it's the same letters. It's the same root. Um, something that I just thought of. So does anyone know the Sephardic custom of having a henna? So henna, what, what's a henna? What's a henna? Does, has anyone been to one? In Morocco, right? So painting, they put some dye on your hand, put a cotton swab on it, and then tie up a ribbon and, and you go to a party and you just think it's all about the party, right? Until I had my own henna, because I married a Moroccan man. So the night before my wedding, after I went to the mikvah, came home to a party, like a whole henna party, didn't know what I was doing. I remember my friend saying to me, it's not too late to pull out. <laughs> and seriously, they were like, my daddy's grandmother from Tunisia was braiding my long hair that was still dripping wet from the mikvah. I had literally just come out of the mikvah. She's braiding two long braids. And they put like this hat on my head of coins. I'll try to, I'll send you guys a picture on the chat. Yeah, it's, it was actually really beautiful. And they're draping materials around me. And I'm just like barely 20 years old. And I think my mother looked shell-shocked. Like, what are we getting ourselves? We're so Ashkenazi that this was a little, this was a little different. But what I learned that night was the word chena, right? The chena, the dye, stands for the three mitzvot of the women, Jewish women. Chala, Nida, which is Tahara Tamishbacha, family purity, and the hay is Hadlakat Haneirot. So, candle lighting, okay? The three mitzvot of the women. So, and I had no idea. I just thought it's a party, like party, party, but no, there's meaning to it. So, that's the, the acronym for Chana. Chala, Nida, Hadlakat Haneirot, the three special mitzvot just for the women. Okay, so that's the name. Pretty cool. Oh yeah, well, it depends who she marries, right? She, uh, Laura asked if my daughter will have that. Please God, please God, please God. We are looking, we are taking applications right now. <laughs> just joking, I'm not, we're not desperate. We're just, we are open. <laughs> okay, but um, she's 20. Yeah, so she, she started looking, we started looking. Oh yeah, yeah, we're, we're very open. So, um, so if she marries an Ashkenazi guy, so chances are, we won't have like a full on, full out um, henna because because she'll be coming Ashkenazi. Like the woman takes on, like there's different things that go through the man, go through the woman. Like we know that Jewish woman, Judaism comes through the woman, but but the the type of Jew, the type of sex goes through the man. So we have to give them something, right? <laughs> so, so but but it's, I, I don't know. I mean, I would, I, think even like if my mother-in-law comes from Israel please God um we'll probably have a henna and you guys are all invited it's it's so phenomenal have you I mean you have to go to a henna party in your life it's it's so incredible but to know the meaning and the the whole culture of it the music the the garbs the everything it's just yeah yeah Chana yeah the root of it is chen, which, which is um, the way it's translated here. It's grace, actually. Grace. But like chen is a Yiddish word. And chen means grace. But chana, I mean, there's some, there's a lot of different ways you could understand the word. But it's you could just see that it's a very positive presence of a Jewish woman. No, so Chana, Chana and Hena, it's the same letters. So, I mean, sometimes you have to kind of like stretch your imagination. I'm, I'm, I, it says over here, it talks about the Chain of Chana. I added my own interpretation of like the Hena, the Chana, it's the same letters. So take what works for you. Yeah, and if you know a Chana in your life, you should tell her, right? You should, your daughter? Okay, there you go. So first of all, She's named Hana. What a powerful name because of what she gave to Jewish women forevermore, right? Her and for the Jewish people, not only women. 
So you tell her who she's named for, whether it's Hannah, like her great grandmother, but still there's an element of her essence, right? Because a name is very, very powerful. So there's an, there's an element of the story of Hana, this, this amazing heroine woman and what she, what she brought to the world. So she has a little bit of that in her DNA. Okay. Plus everything else that you want to add in. Okay. So let's go back to the story. So Hana is married to um, a beautiful, righteous man. His name is Elkanah and they have a great marriage. They have a loving relationship. You know, they, they, they travel. She seems, by the way, I really connect to this character because I love people. I go out of my way to meet people. If there's even a longer way of walking, I will walk the longer way because I might, you know, bump into someone that lives like at that house. Like I might even wave and that's enough to make me happy. My kids, my kids joke about me. This is, I overheard my kids say this about me this week to my husband and it was really funny, but it was true. So in Portland, um, there was a store that I really liked. Okay, Regina, you'll understand this, okay? People like us, type threes, okay. So it was an Israeli store. I love the owners and I love their clothing. Like it's Israeli and Italian clothing. And although I could never afford really to buy more than like maybe once a year on my birthday, I would go in and actually buy something. It gave me a lot of joy to drive by the store, even though it was out of the way home from school every day. I drove the long way. And my kids were like, why do we have to take this way? And I'm like, I just want to see the windows and wave at my friends in the store, literally. So this is Hana. Hana and Elkanah, they travel three times a year, a pilgrimage up to Jerusalem, because all the Jews in Israel did that at the time for the three main holidays, Sukkot, Shavuot, and Passover. And, and everyone did that. They lived in Shiloh, so it was quite the pilgrimage. And every time they went, they took a different path, a different route, so that they could encourage people, different people to come along, come get your, come on, just grab your coat, let's go. We're gonna have so much fun together. So each time they traveled, they, they basically took a different route to meet new people along the way and encourage people to come be part of the Jewish people, right? Isn't that amazing? I love that. So what we learn from her, like one of the qualities that we see in Hana is open-heartedness. She is just, and that's such a beautiful word like open-heartedness it means so much it, like I, I i mean i look at this room everyone here has the most beautiful hearts it's 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 a kindness it's an openness it's a curiosity it's it's the wanting to help it's you know that stuff so so that's who they were they were open people they were lucky she had everything she has she's a happy person but there was one thing in her life that she did not have and she really really wanted and yearned for and that was a child she did she was not blessed with a child like all the other matriarchs that we spoke about sarah rebecca rachel had to wait leah was given right away oh but leah god had compassion then it, it says and he opened her womb meaning she was supposed to be barren right and we learned before god desires the prayers of the righteous people so there's something that needs to be unlocked over here and then god will eventually bless her with samuel okay so but the story we're in the middle of the story and it's looking really really a, a sad she's aching for this child intense yearning deep desire um it, it's a longing that she has from the depth of the depth of her soul and um and she's obviously praying and praying for for a change okay what what have the other matriarchs done in the past those that were barren what have some of them done sarah um rachel leah what did they do in order for their husbands to have the children that they were supposed to have what concubine okay so it was very often it was very common in those days take my hands made maybe and i will be built up through her maybe she'll have the child okay so once again this is she says well if all my matriarchs did this and by the way it says here sarah rachel and leah it wasn't rebecca so that's what she says she tells her husband take another wife and um and maybe will god will have mercy on her okay and at that point in the story in comes in the next woman, Penina. So, Pen, sorry, Elkanah. Elkanah was her husband with two men in this 
like in this chapter that are pivotal to the story. Elkanah is her husband, and Eli is the Kohen Gadol. We're going to meet him soon. Okay, but now let's meet Penina. Okay, so Penina comes in. Penina might have been her neighbor. Penina, by the way, what does Penina mean? Pearl. Okay, good. Um, and many people are named Penina. Is that your name? Okay. It's your Hebrew name. Beautiful. What's what's Penina in Yiddish? Okay, Peril. Peril. That's so nice. Okay, so very interesting to know, because we've spoken about this. Do we give names after people that died young or did something bad with their life? Or I don't know, there's, there's, it's complicated when it comes to names. And right, we had that conversation a couple of weeks ago. We spoke, some people will add a name to it. Some people will add a, a kavanah, an intention, you know, to uplift that name, right? So. Penina is a very, very common name in Judaism. So let's be open-minded to the story that's going to unfold over here. So Penina comes in. She's considered to be a good and righteous woman. She was fertile, like fertile myrtle, like very fertile. She has child after child after child. She, 10 and all. Every, every time she has a baby, there she is again, sporting her maternity wear, okay? 10 children at all, okay? She's popping them out. And the Midrash tells us, so this is not face value. This is not like the shot, but the Midrash, the stories around it tells us that Penina taunted Hana. Maybe it was her mere existence that taunted her, right? We, we don't know if it was necessarily her words, but it says that she flaunted her own motherhood and it made Hana feel bad, mm -hmm. right? And I mean, Hana's empty womb, empty arms, it's a very... It's very painful. It's just painful. And by the way, when you you are that person in pain, when you're that person needing someone, it's not even the reality. It's your reality, your perception. Because I remember there were two years that I was trying so hard to have a baby. And everywhere I went, it looked like, it seemed like to me, everyone was pregnant, right? It, it's always like that. And it's only after, you know, you go through something, like, God forbid, like, you know, you go through something that you realize so many people have that, right? Like it's, it's so common, but we see the world through our lens. Okay. So she's feeling very, very bad for herself. And um, the, the in different, there's different interpretations about Panina. Was she righteous? Was she not? So one interpret interpretation says that Panina was trying to make herself look good. But another one said that she knew that all Hana needed to do was pray. Because God holds the key to, to really everything, but there are a few things that are not dependent on your mazel. They're only, it's only God that holds the key. And one of them is the key to having children. Okay? I mean, nowadays, uh, tech, medical advancements and everything, it's very, very common that if someone is experiencing infertility, there's a very high chance with all the offerings that the medical world has, very high chance that you could, you might, there's a chance that you could have a child, but it's not a hundred percent. It's not a hundred percent. And only that is God. Okay. So Panina, it could be Panina just knew that she just needs to be so down on her knees that there's nothing else that she could, no one else to turn to. No doctors could help her. Nothing. She is so in pain that now she'll pray so hard that maybe God will grant her this child. Okay. So I guess like we could all decide for ourselves. We don't know. We don't know what it was, what her intention was, okay? So, so, but there was fault. There was fault found in Penina because although she, she pushed Hana to cry to God in such a deep place, and although Penina might have had good intentions, there was also a little bit of arrogance there to treat a woman that's already suffering with even a bit of cruelty. So she is actually held accountable for that. And does anyone know what her punishment is? So all of her children die, all of Penina's children. Yeah, she has a very, very, um, a very drastic punishment, yes. Why did the kids, I'm saying, 
Yeah, yeah, that's that's a good it's a good question. Well, I, we don't know what their kids' stories were. Like, it, like we don't know what their stories were. I don't know much about her kids, but that's it's a pretty it's a very drastic. Um, can't remember which passage, but anyway, the sons of the fathers would be. The sins of the fathers would be given to the sons and their sons. Uh huh. So I think you can go both ways. Well, I don't know. I mean, it, I don't know. That's a very it's an interesting question. If kids are responsible, if they if they carry on the sin of their parents, that's a good question. I, I'm gonna look into that a little bit. And I like as Bonnie said. I mean, she just quoted that. Yes, you do carry it on. Things are passed down. But there's sometimes a tikkun, like a rectification that a child needs to do for their parent or for their grandparent, or it could be generations, and there's an atonement. So maybe this whole family dynamic was part of this atonement. Uh-huh. Right. Yeah, sure. So the thing is, they can't hear you. Oh, wow. Yeah. Okay. So what Mimi is saying is very. The sisters of the right. Yeah. Yeah. How things get passed down. Yeah. The apple doesn't fall far from the tree. I mean, it's, it's, I mean, to be a self made person is a very looked up kind of like that's a nice thing to say. Like someone that pulls himself out from, from the ashes and, and makes a life for himself is very impressive rather than just like, you know, following. It's all you know, it's all you know. Let's let's get back to the story because it's a fascinating conversation about you know how things are passed out in a negative way and if we still are accountable for for the sins of our past. I mean, we're still atoning for Adam and Eve's sin, right? Like like there's certain things that are passed down that you know things change in the world because of actions. You know, and everything has ripple ripple effects and ramifications. Okay. So now let's go back to the storyline. So we have Hannah and Elkanah, beautiful couple, beautiful marriage. She's like, take, take another woman. Have, another, have a child through, through someone else. And Elkanah says, I don't need any children. I, like, I'm okay just with you. Like, I just, I love you. And he actually says to her, am I not as good to you as 10 sons? Okay. He, he's like, we have each other. Like, you know, and there's so many beautiful, more modern stories. I'm sure you've heard some of these stories. It's um, one of them is in the times of the Gemara. So let's say another thousand or 2000 years later, famous story that's written down of a husband and wife that were married for a, over a decade, no children. And the wife felt so guilty. She felt like she couldn't give him children. So she encouraged her husband, divorce me, take another woman build up a family, have a, a legacy and a heritage and all of that. And um, so they actually, I mean, she's begging him, please, I love you so, so much. I want you to have children. I want you to have a family. So they actually get to the point where they're like, okay, and this is a conversation for a long time. They have a big party. It's called a Sudas Preda, which is like a party of saying goodbye, like a goodbye party. And they're at the goodbye party. If you for sure know the story, it's such a great story. So they're at the party and they're like gonna like, you know, divide up the wealth and she's gonna go back to her her mother's home with whatever she wants to take from what their meager belongings. And um, and he says to her, take anything you want, take anything. I love you so, so much, take anything you want. So when he wakes up in the morning, he's in her mother's house because <laughs> he fell asleep after drinking so much and he was that she took him. She carried this man to the, and, and they ended up staying together because all she wanted was him. 
right? They were so in love with each other. By the way, this is a true story. And I have like so many stories. One day I have to write a book. One of my, one of my momentum women, this was a very impactful part of my life, a very impactful experience for me as a married woman. I went with her to get her get. Has anyone ever been to a basin to see a get? Or yourself, it could be you had a get, you had a get. I was blown away. I said, I remember calling my mentor after I said, they should tell every kala, like every bride before her wedding to experience a get giving ceremony because it impacts on you how important marriage is mm -hmm. with the, there's a whole like piece of parchment and mm -hmm. meaning like it's written on cloth, on, on parchment, skin of an animal, mm -hmm. beautifully written by a scribe. And then they have to take the documents and cut it in half and they rip it and you have to, it's just, it was so mind blowing to me. It, I said, mm -hmm. if, if we understood how important marriage is before, maybe we wouldn't have so many gets being given. Like for me, it was like mind blowing. Anyways, as I'm walking in with my friend, Adriana, we're walking in to get her get. Her husband was in Miami, by the way. Her ex, soon to be ex-husband was in Miami. He's allowed, you're allowed to have a shaliach, a messenger to pick, to do the get on your behalf. Sometimes you can't even be in the same room as your soon to be ex that you need a messenger. I don't know. I, I think it could be done both. I think it could be done with messengers. I think she was there. We, I went with her as we're walking into the synagogue, her husband calls her soon to be ex-husband. I was ready to kill him. He says, Adriana, I love you. I'm thinking like, seriously, now we have to go through this. And she's like, I love you too. <laughs> They've had a bunch of kids and all this stuff, but 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 it was definitely time to to say goodbye to the marriage. I mean, definitely things lines were crossed and whatever it was. Anyways, about two weeks ago, she called me up. I was literally climbing into bed, and Adriana's on the phone, and she said, "I just wanted to tell you that Jacques and I got remarried tonight." Oh, and I almost I, I didn't want to say it all along, but I kind of felt like I knew it. Like I knew it because you don't go into a get saying, I love you. I love you. Right. Because clearly there's so much there in the marriage. Okay. So here we are, Hannah and El Kada. They have such a beautiful, loving relationship. He doesn't want to take another woman. And he says, I'm, I'm, am I not enough for you? So, so here is Hannah's, and I'm just going to race the clock a little bit because I really want to get to the end of this. So let's keep all questions to the end. If we could. So here is where Hannah's very famous speech comes in. And this is something that we read on, is it Rosh Hashanah or Yom Kippur? I think it's on Rosh Hashanah that we read Hannah's. It's the Haftorah on Rosh Hashanah. So this is, and, and it's not by chance that we read it on Rosh Hashanah because it really shows that the yearning, the power, and everyone at Rosh Hashanah is yearning for something. So here is part of her, her pouring her heart out to God. She says, every part of a woman's body has a purpose. How could you give me a womb and not fill it? She, she goes through every part. She says, how could you give me breasts? Are they not to nurse a, a baby? Like she, she's just pouring her heart out. She's pleading and bargaining with God. And Hannah promised God that if he gave her a son, she would dedicate his life to divine service. Okay. And okay. So now is the very interesting part of the story. Where is she Where, when she is praying so fervently? She is in the tabernacle, in the Mishkan, in Shiloh. So it's on the outskirts of Jerusalem because it was a few hour walk and pilgrimage when she was going up all the time. She's in Shiloh and she's crying and davening. Her lips are moving, but there's no sounds coming out of them. So Eli, the high priest, he looks at her and he sees this woman that's doing this very interesting. What is she doing? Because this has never been done before, by the way. Like you see it now, you go to the hotel, everyone's swaying and their lips are moving. She put that into the Jewish world ever since this experience, because Eli sees her and says, how long will you be drunken? He literally accuses her of being a drunkard. And she says, excuse me, I'm not drunk. I'm drunk with prayer. I'm pouring out my soul to God. And he, he's, he kind of has to apologize and he gives her a blessing. 
he realizes he was wrong. I mean, this is a holy woman. He didn't even understand like how she could be so, so connected to her prayer because what she was doing and the way she was so in her zone was something that he ne he didn't experience that it wasn't really done before in this way. Prayer has evolved. So, so he says to her, go in peace. May God of Israel grant you what you have asked of him. And she continues her, her prayer, her journey, her worship, but she feels there's like a sense of, of serenity, I think, in her heart. Um, let me just see the words that she says. Oh, it says here, she continues her worship and she was no longer sad. Meaning she just something, it's like sometimes like Hashem just like, I don't know, sometimes you feel like something is lifted. So this is like her, she just feels like she did her part. She put, put, poured it all out. The pain that Panina caused her, whatever it was that brought her to this moment of being so, so intense with, with her yearning for, for this request. She did her part. Ailey blesses her and she goes home. And, um, and then, you know, this is very common. You'll see in the, in the Torah, it says that so-and-so knew, knew her or, and Abraham knew his wife. You see it again and again. It's a euphemism for intimacy. Exactly. So this is what happens. She goes home and it says Elkanah knew Hannah, his wife, and that God remembered her. And so the this is like a deep um, soul merging. This is not just intimacy like what you could get on Netflix. This is like the deepest level of, of intimacy, of body, soul, emotions, of husband and wife that have been through so much and they are blessed with a child not just any child they're blessed with samuel the prophet she gives birth to a son she um she nurses him she weans him and as soon as she weans her child she keeps to her bargain like she said that she'll devote him to the jewish people she brings him to the tabernacle she brings him to Ailey, the high priest. She reminds him that she was the woman that was praying so fervently and asked for a child. And, and, and here he is, he's all yours. So that is, you know, some of the story of, of Hannah and Penina, these two women that were very connected in, in almost in a painful way, but I think they definitely had, um, you know, a part of each other's story. There, there is a connection a deep connection between the two of them. And maybe Panina um, was integral in, in Hana really being so broken that she could cry out in such a way. Uh, is anyone having a hard time with the story of, of Panina? I mean, what, what we know about the story, there's the shot and then there's the midrash, like the stories around it that say that there was cruelty. Um, is anyone having a hard time with any of that? Yeah, to a person that was very sensitive. Yeah, I know. I mean, I, my daughter. I yeah. Her. She's afraid to tell her every time. Yeah, her. yeah. Like, yeah, yeah. So I'm going to read a little bit. I'm just we're going to finish in five minutes. I'm just going to share some of the some of, of the reflections that we could maybe think about. So we all know that pain brings growth. It doesn't, it doesn't always have to be. And, and one of, one of the beautiful blessings that we should give to people is that may you, may you grow gently. May God be gentle with you on your path, right? We don't want harshness. We don't want, we want things that we can handle. We don't want to be broken from it, but pain is inevitable. It's part of the package. We're actually not looking to go through life with comfort is not the value that we're going for, right? We're not looking for a lump, a life of comfort, right? If you think about like movies that you that you want to watch, it's going to be about the guy that goes through hardship and then he overcomes things and he grows and all that. We love watching those movies, but in our own lives, we don't want that. <laughs> we want the comfortable, but that's not the goal. The goal is not comfort. The goal is growth. Okay, so pain is usually part of the package of growth. So um, there is... The, the lesson of sensitivity over here um, that, and, and, and obviously the, the punishment that Penina got was very, very severe, very severe. Um, as much as we, it could be she had good intentions, there was still a little bit of cruelty. So that's also like sometimes, I don't know, let's, let's think of an example. Um, 
I don't know. I've always, I always felt like a terrible, not a terrible mother, but you know, when you hold your, a little child at the pediatrician and, the, and they're getting their shots, right? Like, I mean, I want to cry, right? It's more painful for the mother, but you know that you're doing the right thing. It could be Panina knew that she needed to do this, but are you going to like turn your back from the child? With, no, you're going to hold the child until you're almost there. Three more seconds. You've got this. Like there's a way of helping someone through a hard moment that has a lot of sensitivity. So I think that's where she lacked. She lacked a sensitivity. That's it. It's just, it's a small thing, but it's a huge thing, right? Is there an example someone could think of, of how we could, um, how we could be more sensitive with someone in our life that's possibly going through something hard. You have an example? As you get older and you go experiences and you can sympathize with the other person. Mm. Totally. Empathy. Empathy. Uh -huh. Empathy. Uh -huh. Empathy. If you don't go through Someone dies to say, I'm really sorry. Mm. But if you lose a spot, right. and somebody else loses a spot, and you, mm. can understand you can understand it. it. It's interesting. There's, there's also an idea here that, because when we hear the, the um, punishment, so to speak, that Panina got, it almost feels unfair. But there's another idea that Panina was in on she was on a high level. She was, she's when she enters the scene, she's a good, righteous woman. So it's almost not becoming of her to act with such in insensitivity because she's held up to a higher standard. Do you understand? Like there's everyone's held to the standard. So for her, where she was at, it was very, very severe in the boat over here. Um, did you have something that you want to tell? Uh, uh, huge. Yeah. 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 I guess the, the takeaway, because I think that you really hit it on the head, like, and that was for sure present. Like if she was so like, well, look, look at me, here I am again, expecting. Like that was, it was her arrogance that really rubbed Hannah the wrong way. So I guess the question that we should all ask ourselves is how could I lead my life with a little bit, like a notch higher of sensitivity? Mm -hmm. Everyone needs sensitivity. It's such a basic need. People want to be seen. People want to be heard. People want to be felt and understood. How could we up our level of understanding the person in front of us? You know, just, just kind of like, just going a little deeper I always say like when we see someone how are you fine you know you're you're they're already on the second aisle of the supermarket and you know you're you barely got a chance to say you're if you're okay or not like that's not that's nothing that's like kind of cancels each other out how do we really see someone because we're all rushing 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 we're busy we have a lot of people in our lives how do we see someone and look at them and really ask them are you okay is there something that you need yes awareness right yeah yeah right mm. right and i i kind of like that i wonder if we should use the word um sensitivity like just by saying you know when i saw you you know calling someone and say i saw you at the supermarket you looked worried or concerned about something I might've been a little insensitive. I was rushing, I'm mm -hmm. um, checking it on you now, right? Just using like owning that we could all like up our sensitivities or we might not have had the time in the moment, but lots to learn from these women. Mm -hmm. And um, Hana, I mean, the way that Hana prayed in that moment is how we pray the silent Amida, the prayer that we do three times a day, you know, Shacharis, Min Chamarev, there's always that private prayer, the Shmana Esrei, with the, it has 18 blessings in it, the Shmona Esrei 18. Um, so so that's that comes from Chana. That's her contribution forevermore because of her fervent prayer at that moment of need. So any questions, comments? Mm -hmm. I'll see you guys. Yeah, I'll see you guys in, in two weeks. But yes.
Mm. Yeah. First of all, it's, it's very interesting. So what I, I, I absolutely, I'd love to like think about it a little bit. It's food for thought. A woman versus a man. A woman will say, no, you're not enough, right? But a man doesn't have that, in, that inner inborn need. So true. So true. It will, with all the stories, I feel there's so much relevance. I mean, the same things happen in different, I mean, the example that Mimi gave of bullying, like the cruelty that's out there. And I loved what Mimi said, actually, because it really does trickle down. I mean, I'm, I'm teaching in a high school this year, and it was a little bit of a, like, it, it was a little shocking to me in the beginning. Like I saw, it was the first time I saw chutzpah. My, there's no chutzpah in our household, right? Like my kids cannot get away with chutzpah, okay? So so walking in, like I saw chutzpah, but then I had to understand where the chutzpah was coming from. Like you have to understand, you have to like pan back and see like, oh, it's that family. Uh, like, you know, cause it, we, it all comes from somewhere. We, we, we don't grow up in a Petri dish. So yeah, yeah, very interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Very interesting. I think there's a lot of relevance, even though it's so many years ago. Yeah. Their own DNA. They don't want an adaptive DNA. You know, uh, James Small, the senior, junior, third, mm -hmm. Nice. I think there's a difference. Nice, nice, nice. Okay, guys, I just wanna, I wanna give um, a, a real big plug for the class tonight. Oh, yeah. So our brand new, it's our third week of the Wheel of Wisdom every Tuesday night here at the Lachaim Center and on Zoom if, if, it's, if you don't wanna get out again. But I would highly recommend plugging in tonight to our Zoom or come in person 7.30. We're having Ari Shabbat, who is such a fabulous guy and speaker. And he's the momentum trip leader for the guys. So awesome guy. He's speaking tonight. What was his topic, Julie? Do you know it offhand? Your practice life. He's such an inspirational speaker. Highly recommend. So that's tonight. Um, and then next week, we also have, is next week. Oh, Chava told you? Okay. Okay, good. So we have Chava coming up, also an incredible speaker. It's just every single Tuesday, forgetting in order to remember. Yeah. So every week here, Tuesday night. So Tuesdays are becoming like strong learning days over here. Very excited. Yeah. And I don't even work on just, just, you could like pull up a, a mattress outside, you just stay here, it's all good. <laughs> that's cute. So that's tonight. And then, oh, guys, if you have not our RSVP for Sunday, to be spot is okay. Sunday night, we're bringing in a Kabbalistic rabbi, Israel, who's such a cool guy. Yaakov Lehman, and we're having a full on Tubishvat Seder with wine and food and music and just like a real interactive program. It's on Sunday night here. You could bring kids. It is like he wanted it to be like three hours long. I think we, we made it for like two and a half hours. Like he's like hardcore. I'm like, I don't know if we're that hardcore. Like, you know, two and a half hours is a long time. Yeah, thank you. It's fine. He might stay here all night meditating. I don't know. He's a really cool guy. He does like Tai Chi in the Judean Hills. Like he's literally like one of these like lights, you know, his body kind of weighs down his soul. Yeah, that's so that's coming up on Sunday night. Sign up. Um, and then 
three events coming up. Rosh Chodesh Azar. It's right when I get back um, with Tipora Gelman, who's um, the, the the owner, the founder of Rumba Chicago, and she's she's it's, she's such an inspiration in my life. I'm so excited to bring her to you. She herself has quite a health journey. Like she probably lost, I don't know if it was like 150 or 200 pounds. I mean, she lost a lot of weight, but it's not going to be about weight loss. It's going to be about loving yourself. And so for that series, the Rosh Chodesh series is, is called like, it's called the Rosh Chodesh Living One Room at a Time. So we've been going through every different part of the house. So this is like the home gym. And it's really about like physical and emotional well-being. Right, we have two. This is Rifki's. Rifki's running this program. She's spearheading all the details. Allison, you're going to be here, right? It's on a Thursday night. Okay, well, we'll try to get the whole Froba community to come join us. And um, yeah, really excited about that free event. But we just want RSVP. Oh. Bye, guys. <laughs> Bye, everyone. I'll see you soon.